Good afternoon, everybody. And I can hear the, the, the even more sound that I expected here. Great. Dear students, guests, colleagues, and of course, our esteemed Professor Stephen Effinger. Welcome. Welcome to today's D2 Ørsted Lecture, as we call it. In order to tackle today's complex and interconnected societal challenges, energy, health, education, and many others, we need to take a systems view. We need to think large-scale system designs and management, and we need to architect engineering processes and their interfaces. Professor Eppinger from MIT was therefore the obvious choice for this lecture. And uh, we are certainly honored to have you here today. We are also honored and proud to emphasize our long-standing collaboration with you and your university, which I have also had confirmed over the lunch here today. Very nice to hear about that, especially in engineering system design and product development, especially with DTU management and DTU mechanical engineering. Our collaboration includes PhD students and faci facility visits, joint publications, joint work in the worldwide wild design society, and joint keynote and flagship design conference, just to mention some of the core manifestations. Our esteemed guest today, Stephen Eppinger, is a professor of management science, innovation, and engineering systems at the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, of course, Sloan School of Management, where he holds the General Motors Leaders for Global Operations Chair. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Professor Eppinger's work. He has co-authored a leading textbook entitled Product Design and Development. And not only has this book recently been released in its seventh edition, impressive. It also has also been translated into several languages and used by hundreds of universities around the world. And hundreds of thousands of students have benefited from this book. For sure, every engineering design, product development, and design and innovation engineer graduating from this university. And I also believe that, that, that there's a number in, in this, this group today, like industry representatives in the audience here, have, will have used this book as a core reference. Professor Evinger's research focuses on product development, engineering systems design, and technical project management, and has been applied to improving complex engineering processes in a wide range of industries. Some of the industries that Professor Eppinger has consulted include General Motors, Apple, Swisscom, just to name a few. And we'll be hearing about one engineering system analysis and development approach in particular. I'm told the design structure matrix, DSM, and DSM has proved to be extremely valuable in handling complexity. As a final word, I would like to say we named this distinguished lecture series after our founder at this university, Hans Christian Ørsted, who discovered electromagnetism 199 years ago. We're almost there with 200. <laughs> Ørsted formulated the mission of DTU, which we still follow today. He said, this university is here to develop and create value through natural sciences and technical sciences, and very importantly, why? To benefit society. That's why we are here. Or to put it in, in other words, at DTU, we create technology for people, just like Professor Eppinger. So once again, Professor Eppinger, we are very honored to have you here today. Welcome 
warm welcome to you. We look so much forward to hear what you have to share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It is with deep appreciation to President Bjarklu and the DTU Ersted Board for inviting me today for this honor to deliver the Hans Christian Ersted Lecture. My research is in the area of engineering systems, and in particular to explore the architecture of engineering systems. The purpose of this is to learn better ways to design engineering systems and better ways to develop them, to manage those systems. I'll be sharing with you, as, as is mentioned, a very specific method that I've used quite a lot called Design Structure Matrix, or DSM. I'll teach you just a little bit about that method. The, the details would take a little bit longer, but I'd like to teach you about how exactly this method works, and more importantly, what kinds of insights for developing complex systems that we can generate. And that's really the key to this work having such impact, um, in particularly in industry. And let me start with explaining what is a complex technical system, what we call an engineering system. Um, essentially, I'd like to explain it in terms of what I think of as the scale and the scope is what leads to complexity. And the difference between an important engineering system that is simple to develop and one that is complex to develop is essentially the scale and the scope. So on the left you see an example. This is um, a device developed uh, by a, a team of people that, that I know. Happened to have only 10 people and it took about two years. The scale and scope of that complexity is essentially everyone on the team can understand what everyone else is doing. And if we have an interface, an interaction, an issue to deal with, it's not hard to understand how to deal with it. You talk to the other person who's responsible for that aspect. On the other hand, a project of much larger scale and scope that involves hundreds or even thousands of people, it's basically impossible to know everyone. It's impossible to know who's doing what, with whom do I need to work and coordinate to manage a specific interface. And managing those interfaces is how we create value. It's how we create integration, all those many components flying together in formation, as we say. That's done through a mechanism that in engineering systems research and an application we call integration, connecting, integrating the work, integrating the components, creating performance. And that's just incredibly hard in a complex system. So the realm in which I work is these complex systems. Now, as you know, we don't develop those things at MIT or you know, generally here at DTU either. So the research lab I use is out in the world. So the kinds of companies that I work with have complex systems to develop, complex systems to manage. And the purpose of that is that's where we get the data. That's where we get the context. So at MIT and our research group and our research lab, we can develop the ideas, the methods, the theory, the analysis approach but the application examples all have to come from industry. And so one of the key features of this research is strong connection with industry. How do we do that? How do we create those kinds of connections and partnerships? And you'll see a little bit about that. I've chosen to explain the work in the context of a few examples. So I'll show you examples from aerospace industry, automotive industry, telecommunications industry, electronics. Um, I won't have time to show you all of my wonderful examples. I've picked just a few. Um, the way I'd like to start is by explaining our approach to studying complexity. Um, and the approach says that these systems are complex, not just because they are of large scale and scope, but that large scale and scope leads to complexity in three fundamental domains, the product, the process, and the organization. So the product itself is complex. That's what we call a complex or a, an engineered system. It's got a lot of pieces and components that all have to work together. The process itself is complex. The process is maybe a network of thousands of activities or tasks. The organization is large, probably complex too in terms of interfaces. So what we do is we're exploring the architecture of these and we, do, we explore the architecture in each of these domains. The key technique in understanding the architecture is to recognize that in each domain there is a decomposition. Decomposition, as you probably know, is about breaking up something that's big and complex into smaller and simpler things. And we, uh, we perform that decomposition in each of the three domains. That is, we decompose a complex product, 
into a set of subsystems and sub subsystems and components. So, so that we have this perhaps multi-layer decomposition. It creates a network. And you see a simple tree structure to describe such a network. But that same tree structure would describe also the decomposition of the process. We have many, many things to do. How do we organize that? Well, we split it into a set of maybe phases, and those maybe have parallel work streams for the different types of work that we have to do. So we decompose just to get our head around the complexity of the thousands of things we have to get done. And in a similar way, we decompose an organization. Maybe traditionally we decompose it in terms of reporting relationships, but that's how we get our head around and maybe manage all the many people involved in the organization. Now when I say we study the architecture of these, we have to find the structure. And the decomposition, the splitting up, is only part of the structure. The key part of the structure that really teaches us how it behaves and why it behaves that way is made up of the network of connections. And so when we decompose down into, say, components in a system, those components have interfaces. They have connections. And that network of connections may be simple like this, or it could be more complex. A really simple set of connections would be what we call an ideally modular decomposition. It says each component interfaces with its neighboring component in its subsystem or module, but it has no connections across the whole network. In a similar way, we decompose, we've decomposed the process, so we have input-output relationships, connections between elements of the process, the tasks, the activities. They have ways that they have to work together. And it's not that everything connects to everything, but there is some pattern there. Um, and then finally, in the organization, a really simple organizational network would say everybody works with their teammates, but doesn't work with anyone else. Now, as you know, these networks are never as simple. So a more real or complex structure would say, yes, there are connections across the network. The people, they interface with people across other parts of the organization. Components have interfaces with components in other modules or subsystems. Tasks have input and output relationships, perhaps across the whole network. So on the one hand, it's not that everything connects to everything. On the other hand, the architectures are never ideally uh, decomposed and simple. So how do we get our head around that structure, that architecture? Uh, well, there are a lot of ways to do it. There's a whole field of network analysis that lays out complex, that lays out networks. Um, we use a particular approach, so I'm not going to go through a whole um, litany of alternative approaches. I'm going to just cut to explaining just one, the one approach that we've found to be really helpful. So this is the approach that's called DSM, or design structure matrix. So we make a matrix to represent these networks of connections. And let me show you what that looks like. So in the abstract, we can use that network to model, in this case, the system or product architecture as a set of connections across the components. So let me teach you a little bit about these matrices. Um, this is what we call a square matrix. And if you remember anything from linear algebra, a square matrix is a matrix with the same number of rows and columns. You remember that part? Now this is a special kind of square matrix which has the same labels on the rows and columns, and that's called an n-square matrix. So an n-square matrix with the same labels on the rows and columns, it maps these things in the rows to these things in the columns, these to these. And if we use it in the system architecture domain to represent the network of components in the system, it would map the connections between the components. So the component interfaces. So this diagram is a map of the component interfaces. So it's not components to people. It's not components to suppliers. It's not components to tasks. This is components to components. It's an n-square diagram. Okay. And the idea is that the components are not randomly connected. They have a pattern. And if we can understand this network of connections, we can reveal the patterns. And we can learn, maybe, is this correctly architected? Can we improve the architecture? More importantly, we have the architecture that we have, and we have to implement it. We have to integrate it. We have to successfully develop and integrate those components to make that system work correctly. I will show you examples of how we do this. So that's one domain, the product domain. In the process domain, we can do the same thing. Now, the networks will look different because it's a process model. And process models have directional flow to them. Activities have inputs and outputs and so forth. So I'll teach you a little bit about how this particular type of modeling works. Also, a process model will represent the network of tasks or activities. We write them down on the side. We write them along the top. We order them in a certain way. And we can reveal the process flow. And we can identify why does the process take so long? 
Why is it so frustratingly iterative and repetitive and slow? What happens when the process fails? And other things. In the third domain, if you're keeping track, product, process, organization, the third domain, the organization domain, we can do a similar thing. We can decompose the organization into people or teams or work groups or departments, some organizational element. And then we could look at, well, the network of connections across those elements in the organization. How do people work together? To what extent do they communicate or work closely together or not? Now, this, of course, is a binary matrix. You'll notice that all the marks in the matrix are either X or blank, a binary matrix. We don't always do them binary. Sometimes we put in shades of value or different types of graphics or symbols or marks. But I'll show you how we do that. I'll also show you how, just a little bit of how we do the analysis. So for example, here, we might do what's called a clustering analysis to identify, well, this group of people works really closely together, and so does this group, and they have some connections across them. So you see the three pink squares, you know, they have maybe some density within and some different relationships across. Maybe those three pink squares represent people at different locations or sites. Or maybe one of them is a supplier. And we could look at the connections with those organizations. OK, so in summary, just as the high level, we make these models or maps using this method called design structure matrix. It operates in multiple domains. And I've shown you the three primary ones, product, process, and organization. And now what I'd like to do is to give you an example of each one show you exactly how we do this in each of the three domains. And I'm going to start with the process domain, so the one in the middle. So the process domain, this is looking at how does an engineering process work. And you're probably familiar with some of the things you might expect to see in an engineering process. There would be design tasks like design the product, design the system, design the circuits, create the software, you know, engineering development tasks. There would also be kind of market-oriented tasks like Figure out who the customers are. What's our target market? What's our price point going to be? How will we market or promote the thing? We would have testing and integration tasks, like test the product. And, and we'd have feedback, like, well, after we test it, do we have to redo the design or change the manufacturing or change the prototype? So all those things we should be able to reveal by looking at an engineering process. And that's what we're going to try to do. I'm going to show you one example. And this example comes from some work I've done with Intel. So Intel, as you know, is in the semiconductor business. They make the world's computers work with microprocessors, video chips, other kinds of semiconductors. And you know what? They're good at it. They didn't need me to come in and say, you're doing it all wrong. Here's the right way to do it. What do I know about semiconductors? All I know is about how we do this network process analysis. Okay? Um, so what we did is um, we studied their as-is process. So this is a representation of how it works. And it works. They're very successfully developing products all the time. And yet, even though they're arguably a world leader in this field, they can do it better. A and they know it. So the, the, so the reason they asked us to do this analysis is they know they can do it better. And they have a huge process improvement effort. And the question is, could this approach, could this method help them maybe put them on a better path toward process improvement? Well, let me explain how it did that. OK, first, how to read this diagram. So it's a square matrix. It's decomposed. The process is decomposed into activities or tasks. And on the left-hand side of the diagram, you read a list of activities from top to bottom, top being the earlier activities that starts up the process, later being down the bottom toward the, the later activities. Maybe I'll point to the one in the, in the center screen here. Um, so at the top, you have activities named, for example, set customer target, establish pricing direction, figure out the timeline and the methods and so forth. In the middle are the technical, sort of the engineering activities, and the top half is what in systems engineering we call the design and decomposition portion of the process. So you have design and decomposition tasks, things like mod high-level modeling, target spec, validation planning, functional modeling, which really means circuit design, schematic design, uh, layout, so geometrical layout of the portions of, of the semiconductor chip. The second half of the process is about um, building, testing, validation, quality control, validation of that everything works right. So the second half in systems engineering, this is the integration side of the process. Uh, so basically from roughly number 30 down, it starts that process, generate masks in the fab, 
um, make the wafers and package the product into little semiconductor chips. Sample functionality out to customers, validation of uh, the environment and the function, life testing of the chips, thermal testing of the chips, certification, production, deliver product at the bottom. Okay? So it's, it's their engineering process, top to bottom. Now you might say, gee, you know, this is at the level of 60 tasks. You probably imagined it's way more complex than that. So there's a level of granularity here. And uh, sure, I could have shown you this at the level of 600 tasks but it would be very difficult to read. And what we've actually found is that there's a certain level at which they manage the process. Yes, they execute it at the deepest detail level, but they lay out, they manage, they coordinate the process at roughly this level. So this is the level at which it makes sense and we get a lot of mileage in terms of uh, seeing how the process works. Now, what do you see in the matrix itself? Okay, I'm gonna separate this into roughly three regions. The lower, below the diagonal, the green shaded region, along the diagonal, the yellow shaded region, and then above the diagonal, you see the pink shaded circles. So let's start with the green ones. So green for good. So the idea is below the diagonal, there are activities near the top that do some work, create some information. So these interfaces represent information flows from an earlier activity to a later activity. And that's basically easy because the earlier activity does the work, the information is available for a later activity when they need it. And so those are, you might think of those as feed forward. We feed forward information down to the later activities. And there are plenty of those. So those are roughly, we don't need to worry too much about them in terms of improvement of the process. Now along the diagonal, you'll see these um, yellow shaded squares. And the idea of the yellow shaded squares is that these are activities that are done together all at once. They're done jointly. Now, why would they do a network of activities, a group of activities together? Well, what happens is one activity needs information from two or three others. Those activities need information from some others. Those activities need information from some of the same others. And so they're kind of tied up together in some kind of complex loops or circuits of information flows. And there are a number of these. And, and there's a reason why they're connected together. They're executing some kind of higher level function. For example, if you were to look at, well, what are the six activities making up this square? You could read them, and, and if I get this right, the development methods, macro targets, financial analysis, program map, QFD matrix, technical requirements, that's an engineering planning activity. So the whole bundle of engineering planning activities, they're done together. And what it means when they're connected in such a coupled square says, you're not done with any one of them until they're all done, because they affect each other. And some of these coupled squares of activities nest with each other. So like, here's a group of 10 activities. They iterate, solve that design, layout, sort of engineering, circuit design problem. They figure that out. They do a number. So essentially, they figure out this circuit design that's called functional modeling. They do a number of types of analyses. And this sets up what we call a planned iteration. So they plan to execute these design and analysis activities together. The design creates some results that are then analyzed, and then they redesign it. And that planned iteration, you might think, you know, one or two iterations and you're done. Well, it depends how complex it is. They may execute five iterations, maybe 10 iterations, which is to say they'll redo the design after analysis multiple times. That planned iteration, I call that a good iteration. So that's not a failure, that's just a complex problem and how it's solved through an iterative approach. On the other hand, the pink shaded circles, the marks above the diagonal, these represent, you might call them feedbacks. A later activity does some work, reveals a problem. And the way we solve that problem is we go back to earlier activities which were done. They were done, they were not expected to have to iterate again. And so these are kind of probabilistic. That is, in some sense, we might take this feedback path, we might take that one. At Intel, when we showed them this model to the engineering managers there, they called these failure modes. They said, these are the ways the process fails. You know, we expect it to be done and done right, but sure enough, we have to go back, loop back, and fix it because we didn't. And these failure modes became the process improvement path. Because every one of them, it could take a long time. And let, let me illustrate that for you. 
So I've labeled some of these unplanned iterations around thermal test failures. So they're down here late in the program, activity number 54, thermal testing. So the chip is almost ready for production. They're so doing thermal testing. Run the chip, make sure it doesn't overheat. But it fails. It overheats. So what happens when it fails thermal testing? Well, what the model shows us is we sometimes go back to here. Two steps back from thermal testing is 52 manufacturing process stabilization. It takes a couple of days. They fix the manufacturing process. Everything's good. Sometimes it fails thermal tests, and the process was fine. So they have to go back to here or here. And these both relate to what's called packaging. So if you're familiar with semiconductor chips, what, what, what comes off the wafer, the little die, is just the functionality of it. Then they bond tiny little gold wires onto that and put it into a ceramic package. That's what you see as a semiconductor chip is the package, actually. And what's happening is they have to go back to package design or packaging. Why? Because it's the package that's not dissipating the heat correctly. You have to go back and figure out a new package of material or shape or size or design or something to make it properly f pass the thermal test. And that could take weeks. What happens if it fails thermal tests and there's nothing wrong with the manufacturing? The packaging is as good as we can get it. They have to go back to circuit design, this 17 functional modeling. They basically design a circuit that runs too hot no matter how we package it. So now they have to iterate the circuit design again. And no, they hadn't planned to do that. And that could take months. Not because circuit design itself takes so long, but after you get that, you've got to run through a whole bunch of these other activities to make sure some of them have to be repeated. So you could think of the above diagonal pink shaded circles as risks. So these are, well, I call them unplanned iterations. They're unplanned feedback paths, which they only take sometimes, depending on exactly how it fails. So just to finish the story with Intel, this helped them figure out, well, how do we make our process better? And of course, now that I've explained it to you, I'm sure it's clear to you that you make the process better by reducing those risks. So how do you reduce risks? So the, the traditional risk analysis approach largely applies here. Identify the probability of the risk. Identify the impact of the risk. You could multiply those two together, get an expected duration, for example, or impact of each risk. You could parade all those, fix the biggest ones first. That's exactly what I recommended. They said, Professor, you got the wrong idea. You've finally shown us all of our failure modes. We're just going to fix them all. So I did this fancy analysis of risk analysis. said, no, we're going to put a process improvement team on every one of those risks, and we're going to make them all go away. And that's what they did. So they found ways, for example, how do you make the thermal test not fail? Not fail due to manufacturing process problems. Not fail due to packaging problems. Not fail due to circuits that just run too hot. And that became the process improvement path for several years, actually. OK, that's one example to show you the power of this analysis. The analysis itself is pretty easy. We collect the data. We display it this way. There's some analytical things we do that I, didn't, that I kind of skipped over. But it, it yields insights that were not available in other ways. So just to put a fine point on one key lesson that sort of academically came out of this, when I published this example and did this work um, uh, for the first time, we were able to explain why is it that iterations happen in engineering design? Why are they fundamental? And most importantly, the difference between a planned iteration, these are things you know where they are, and your job is to facilitate those, make them happen faster. Design analysis iterations are a good example of a planned iteration. An unplanned iteration, on the other hand, is different. And that's where we apply our risk analysis thinking. So these are things we want to make them go away rather than facilitate them. I'll show you a second example. Um, and this is work that is actually quite current. One of my current research sponsors is Swisscom in Switzerland. They're a, a telecommunications company. Um, so this is largely cloud-based operating systems and software development. Um, and, and one of the themes of my very current work is looking at how engineering processes have moved from largely planned and staged processes to largely agile and highly iterative processes. And one of the things, if you know anything about agile, is agile processes are essentially all planned iterations and no unplanned iterations. That is, anything that's unplanned is just in the next iteration, and we've always planned to do more of them. 
Um, so I was very curious, well, how would a highly iterative, planned iteration-based, agile process look at, at, at large scale? Um, so I won't go to the details of this example, but I just wanted to illustrate, you know, a, as a second example, what, what roughly does it look like and what do we learn from it? Um, so I'm sure most of you don't know a whole lot about how large-scale software is develop development is created using a scaled agile process called SAFE. It's a very trendy process these days right, right now in, in the industry. Um, but the key thing that it does is it lays out multiple iterations at a time, typically five, a, a series of five iterations at a time, which takes about 10 weeks. So it's a, it's a certain way to kind of scale up the general principles of Agile into large-scale engineering. So, and these, these, um, so, so at, the, at the low level, five iterations, which they call sprints, five sprints make up a PI, a program increment. And the idea is that there are iterations happening at the low level within the teams every day, every week, every two weeks is a sprint. There are iterations happening at the planning level, and those are happening roughly quarterly. Quarterly planning, which they call product increment or program increment planning, PI planning. And those happen about every 12 weeks. And so there's feedback happening from the release that happens toward the end of each of these PIs back to the planning process. There's feedback from that planning process to the kind of the global quarterly and sort of corporate planning process. And these things have actually all been incorporated into a modern and a more agile process, even at large scale in software. So this work over the years that has looked at the process models has stood the test of time. We've been able to model this for dozens of organizations. I've shown you two examples in very different industries. What I'd like to do now is to say, well, that was just one type of model, the one in the middle, the process model. Um, I think to make this a complete lecture, I should show you an example of the other two types. So I wanna show you now an example of the organizational design structure matrix. So same basic idea, we lay out in a square matrix a network of connections. But now we've decomposed the organization into things like people and teams and work groups, okay? And the connections across them is gonna be the nature of the structure, the architecture, the network we look at. So let me show you how this will work. And I'll show you an example from the auto industry, from General Motors. Um, and this is a classic example of this because um, you know, General Motors has, a, let's just say, a traditional organizational structure. And I'm going to be able to suggest for General Motors a more appropriate organizational structure. Now, honestly, as an engineer, I never thought I'd get into org design. And that's a social science realm. Um, but even the org design folks in social science don't generally approach it this way. Um, you'll see that this is based on actually how the people need to work together. So let me show you how this works. Okay, so the example here comes from development of a, an internal combustion engine. So this is what's in 99% of automobiles still today. Someday, I'd like to find that these are extinct, but you know, for now, this is still a really important uh, field. Um, so the way General Motors organizes developing an engine is, well, they split the engine up into a bunch of components. And then what's done in almost every industry I've ever worked with is they assign a team to every component. That's not an unusual mapping. One component for each team. So in this case, they split the engine up into things like engine block and cylinder heads and camshafts and valve trains and all that. So you may be familiar with what some of those things do. Um, and then each component then has a team, a component development team, CDT, or they call it a PDT, a product development team. And let's assume for the moment every team knows what it's doing. It's got the right sort of concurrent engineering cast of characters to do their component. Um, the question is, how do they work across the components to make the engine work, not just to have a good crankshaft, right? And the answer is they need to manage this network of connections. So here what we did is we asked each team how frequently, that's the units of analysis here, how frequently do they interact with the other teams? Do you interact with them daily? Do you interact with them weekly, monthly? So very crudely assessed, a very simple assessment. Each team had to tell us daily, weekly, monthly for the other 21 teams. We put those data into this matrix and well now we try to make some sense out of it. Well, as pretty much every company reminds me s for as soon as I get through the door, they say, you know, we already know how to do this. Why don't we just tell you how we're doing it now? And I've always found that the existing way of doing it is a very useful starting point because it allows us to ground our work in incremental changes which are much easier to adopt. Okay, so how are they doing it now? The way they're doing it now is 
they split the engine up, actually not just into 22 components, but really into four subsystems and then a set of components within each. Another way to think of it is they group the components into subsystems. And they do what they call systems engineering, which is to say they engineer the subsystems and the components, and they try to get the components to work together in the subsystem before they get it to work in the whole system. Okay, this is the layout of the subsystems. For example, the short block, think of it as the bottom of the engine. It's comprised of six PDTs. The induction, that's where the air and the fuel mix together. That's another six PDTs. Valve train, that's the top of the engine. Emissions and electrical, you know what that is. Uh, so essentially, each PDT is on one of these subsystem teams. And what they do is they meet. They work together. They meet every other Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon, all the system teams meet. The people on those teams get together and they talk about, you know, how do they get their set of components to work together. So now if I were to put that in the matrix, here's what you'd see. Essentially, I've clustered the component teams according to what subsystem they're assigned to. And so essentially what you see is inside the four colored squares, those are the system team meetings that happen every two weeks on Thursday afternoons. They're working across those teams to make, you know, to figure out how do you get the components to work together, to get the whole induction system to work correctly and create, you know, engine performance in that way. Well, that's fine, well, and good, but what happens to all those marks in the white space? Okay? So the white space represents people need to work together, but there's no formal structure. There's no meeting. There's no way to make sure we get that done. That, to me, represents a huge opportunity. You know, what if there were a way to cluster this differently, such that maybe more of the interfaces happen inside the meetings, the teams, the formal structure, and fewer of them, we just hope for them to happen correctly outside of those, right? Okay, so obviously what comes to mind is clustering analysis, right? And if you're familiar with clustering analysis, you might say, well, actually, that, that may not be a bad clustering analysis. I'm not sure we could come up with a better one. Well, you don't want one that just says, well, it's all in one cluster. You know, but, is, but two clusters, three, four, and what arrangement would optimize that? So we could, you know, you have to come up with an appropriate optimization penalty function, and that's exactly what we do. Um, well, let me just show you what that analysis revealed. So here's the suggested systems engineering organization structure. You'll immediately notice that our cluster analysis allowed for some cross-membership across the teams. So you know, there's a mutually exclusive clustering analysis, and then there's one that allows for this kind of overlap. Um, the overlap is quite useful. And, and what overlap means is, you know, here's a system team, which is, happens to be pretty similar to the bottom of the engine short, short block team. But some of the components, engine block A, for example, happens to inter interface a whole lot with some teams that are on system team number two. So they're assigned to two teams. So that means is on, you know, two different afternoons, they've got to have system team meetings. Um, some teams, though, look here, cylinder heads and intake manifold, just due to the way this whole network is laid out, they need to work with people on three different teams. So they're on assigned to system team two and teams three and four. You see, I split their interfaces up into B1K1 here, B2K2 over here. So cylinder he heads and intake manifold are on three different system engineering teams. Why? Well, that's just the way the interface is worked out. Worse yet, the group at the bottom, accessories, ignition, the uh, electronic control module, electrical and assembly, these are so highly integrated across everything, they basically said, we got to work with everybody. So that's why their rows are so full. And their columns are very full too, which means everybody else said, we got to work with them a lot too. So how do we organize them? Well, I actually didn't know, you know exactly how to organize them. So I, but I suggested, well, this is a, at least a, a new arrangement of the organization to the program managers. And I said, well, here's what you got. We got four system engineering teams. They liked that because they already had four. And now it's just a different four, OK? And then there's a fifth team, which I called the integration team here. They actually said, you know, that's like a platter that holds everything else up. They call it the platter team. And the idea is that these are the teams that are so highly integrative. What system engineering team do you put them on, right? Um, so here's what they did. They assigned system team one to meet on Monday afternoons, system team two to meet on Tuesday afternoons, team three, Wednesday, team four, Thursday. What do you suppose they told the integration team to do? 
meet on Fridays, right? But more importantly, they said, well, look, if you're on, for example, lubrication, I, you got to meet on Monday and Tuesday. And if you're on, you know, three different teams, you got to meet, you know, every two weeks to three different system team meetings. And they said, these guys at the bottom, maybe what they should really do is go to all the other system team meetings. What they do on Friday is probably less important, but really critically, they've got to interface with all the other teams. That's what their job is. They're highly integrative components and subsystems. So that's exactly the organization structure that they implemented. This is the diagram they literally put up on the wall. They said, the matrix is nice, professor, but we just need to know who's on what team. And so this is, <laughs> and the result of this was this engine program, which was in the first half, it was still in the design phase when we had this, if you will, intervention. We did this analysis, suggested this structure. In the end, I went back to them two years later and asked how did it go. They said it was the smoothest engine integration phase, that is ramp up into production, than we've ever had before. So this new structure made a huge difference to them. Okay, I've shown you two examples, process, organization, the third dimension, the system or product architecture. Um, I'm going to call this system architecture because many, what, mostly in the literature we call this product architecture, but those of us who work in engineering systems, we think of it as it's the architecture of the system and the way it breaks down. So I actually like to use the language system architecture. Um, let me show you an example of how this looks for a system. Okay, so what are we going to do here? We're going to break up the system into what? subsystems, components, modules, you know, smaller pieces. And we're going to ask, how do they interface together? What's the pattern? What's the architecture of that set of connections? I'll show you an example from the aerospace industry. So this comes from some work we've done with Pratt & Whitney. So Pratt & Whitney makes jet engines on the big commercial jets. They also make military jet engines. Um, sorry, so big, big compressor, you know, turbine engines. Okay. Um, so What's the architecture of this kind of system? Well, the idea here is we decompose the system into subsystems, and there are eight subsystems. And there, are, I'll just name them for you. From front to back of the engine, there's a fan subsystem. There's a low-pressure compressor. There's a high-pressure compressor. There's the combustion chamber, which is sometimes called burner diffuser. There's a high-pressure turbine and a low-pressure turbine. So front to back, that's how they run that Carnot cycle, create thrust. Um, there's also two more subsystems that are more distributed throughout the engine. One is called mechanical components, the other is externals and controls. And these are things like ducting, piping, shrouds, wiring, things that, even the main shaft that keeps everything rotating together. So things that are more connective and distributed around the whole engine. Okay, now the matrix itself, um, those, those subsystems are then, then broken down into, of course, many components, things like fan blades and compressor vanes and bearings and whatnot. And so there are 54 major components, the making up, and they're organized into those eight subsystems. Now, for those of you who study engineering systems, you might look at this and, and, and try to reveal something about this pattern, okay? One of the things that this pattern might tell you is, okay, if these red and pink marks represent the interfaces between the different components, for the most part, each subsystem has a lot of interfaces inside and relatively few across. That is, there's more white space outside the black squares than inside the black squares. A and, and let me just say, that's not just a simple observation. That's statistically significant. Um, in particular, the first six subsystems are much more modular. And by modular, we mean a lot of interfaces inside, very few across. Whereas the last two subsystems that are so connected across, they're actually less modular, right? They have, you know, fewer connections inside, a whole lot across. Now, what would that mean? If you were developing one of those components, I mean, let's say it was your job to work on, I don't know, a turbine blade or something, you know, inside here, you'd be very connected to your other turbine component engineers, and you'd be less connected to, you know, a fan blade engineer. On the other hand, if you were working on, I don't know, a shaft or a d shroud or something that's in part of externals and controls, you wouldn't have as much connection inside, but you'd have a whole lot of connection across because your job is, you know, making sure the whole thing integrates and fits and works together. So this was a, the, the first time that engineering systems were looked at in this way in terms of what's the layout of the network of connections. 
And what is the impact of that network of connections on the kind of integration of it, getting it all to work together? One organization that took this to heart is another in the aerospace business. Uh, you may be familiar with NASA, the space agency in the United States. Um, NASA took this and layered onto it what NASA has been pioneering, which is a method called technology readiness levels to assess component technology risk. And they used this in the following way. They said, we can create a version of the matrix. I'd done a number of sort of numerically weighted versions of this matrix. They did one version of it where they would weight the interfaces between the components based on how risky is each component. Now, what would make a component risky? It's brand new technology. What would make a component less risky? It's been used before. So for example, if it flew successfully to Mars on the previous mission, it's carryover technology, low risk. High readiness, low risk. Something's more novel, never flown to Mars before, or never landed on Mars with an air bleg, parachute, you know, deployment system like that, a more high risk, okay? And so, so this column here is the component's risk based on its technology readiness level assessment. Um, and then the numerical value, the idea is that now we could weight the interfaces based on, here's a little formula here, the strength of the, of the interface, so each interface has a strength, how critical is that interface, mm -hmm. times the risk level of each of, the of each of the two components. So times the risk level of the row, times the risk level of the column. So for example, that number 36, that's one of the bigger numbers here, so it's a high risk interface. Well, why is it so high risk? Well, it, it's got a level three, sort of a medium risk component, interfacing with another medium risk component at level three. Three times three is nine. There's a 36 there, so it was a level four interface. Th nine times four is the 36. So it was a highly critical interface with new technology on both sides. So that, of course, is a high risk interface. So this allowed them to lay out for the whole operation, the whole mission, where are all the high risk interfaces? Where are the high risk areas of development? So that's an example of a system architecture analysis. Let me just step back for a moment and say, well, okay, w one could do these analyses at one, one domain at a time, right? I showed you a product domain, I showed you a process domain, I showed you an organization domain example. I got a few extra minutes. I'm gonna show you an example that takes two of those domains together. It's not going to explode your head. Hold on. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm going to make this work. Um, all right, so here's the idea. I'm going to ask the following question. Um, if I've got a map of the system architecture, and I have a map of the organization architecture, are they similar? Now, why might they be similar? Well, on the what, for the, basically, why do people talk to each other? Well, I might talk to someone on another engineering team if what I'm doing relates to what they're doing. Okay, so what my component does relates to another component, that's laid out in the system architecture. And whether I work with that other person is laid out in the organization architecture. So there's a sensible hypothesis that there ought to be at least some large similarity between the organizational architecture and the system architecture. Okay, essentially, I, I break up the system into components, they have a network. I break up the organization into teams, and they have a network. Are those networks similar? Well, in particular, if this, whatever organization I do this analysis, if they use the simple heuristic of assigning one team for each component, I ought to be able to do this analysis pretty easily. Let me show you how that would work. Essentially, I'm going to have two matrices. So the red matrix will be the system architecture, the interactions between each of the components, the component interfaces. The blue matrix will be the organizational interfaces. And I'm going to do this analysis in an organization where there's one team for each component. And then I'm going to take what we learned in kindergarten, which is that red plus blue makes purple. And I'll put in this comparison matrix a purple shaded cell if there's both an interface between the components and interaction between the teams. And I'll leave it red if there's only an interface between the components. I'll leave it blue if there's an interaction between the teams. Okay, now you probably recognize the red matrix. It's this one from Pratt and & Whitney. And so, okay, so, so this is, we have 54 components. Turns out there are 54 component teams. So I'm gonna go to those teams and ask them, how do they interact? 
And I'm curious, is it going to look similar? Okay. So here's the blue matrix. The blue matrix is, for those 54 component teams, how do they interact with each other? And it actually turns out they have 60 teams. They have six more teams. And I'll just say for, just briefly, those, six enter, those other six teams have no component responsibility. They're not developing a component hardware. They're what they call system integration teams. Their job is delivering performance. So they have names like the thrust team, the noise abatement team, the fuel efficiency team. And those are the kind of the six high-level things that Pratt & Whitney gets paid by their customers for. Okay, I could do some analysis with the six teams. Let's just leave that aside for the moment. Let's just look at the 54 by 54 component uh, portion of this matrix and compare it to the red one. Okay, so we asked the question, is there any similarity between the, between the two? The overall answer is yes. That's the overall answer, yes. And, and by yes, to quantify that, 90% of the cells in that matrix are either the teams interact where the components have an interface, or there is no interface and the teams don't interact. But if you look at the numbers here, of those 90%, the vast majority of them, there's no interaction. I don't know how much credit I can get for those. So, so, so think of it this way. Here's another way to put it. Of the 569 component interfaces in the red matrix, component A interacts with component B, 228 times the teams don't talk to each other. So component A has an interface with component B, but team A does not talk to team B. Now, why wouldn't they talk to each other? Now, here's where I actually think the analysis of the mismatch is more interesting than the analysis of the match. Okay? So why wouldn't two teams talk to each other? And you could develop a number of, let's just say, explanations, or I'm going to call them hypotheses, because I'd like to test them. Okay? So one hypothesis or explanation might be, well, they, they don't need to talk about that interface because the interface has been standardized. So maybe, you know, we developed this, we figured out exactly what the specification is, we write it down, both teams kind of design, build, work to that spec. They don't need to talk about it and renegotiate it because it's been standardized. A variant on that is the same component was used on the previous version of the product, the engine, on each side, so the interfaces probably carry over too. So you can imagine inter uh, explanations like that. And the idea is, if I could actually find out, well, is there an interface spec? Is it written down? Is it carrier? But then I could test each of those hypotheses. Another hypothesis you might more cynically um, make is to say, well, maybe the teams don't talk to each other if they're in different buildings. So, you know, component A interface with component B, but team A is in building A, and team B is in building B, and it's just too far away. You know, or, or let me say, it could be in another city. It could be at a supplier, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the distance could be great. It could either be a physical distance, it could be an organizational difference. They're in a different department. And if we could just find out that information, hey, I got 569 data points. We could test those hypotheses. In a similar way, you could look at the, the, red, the, the blue cells. So the 409 blue cells in the blue matrix, 409 team interactions, how many of them are where there's an interface between the components? And the answer is about 85% of them. That's good. But in the 15% of those cases, team A talks to team B, but the components have no connection. What are they talking about? <laughs> and here again, you could develop some hypotheses. You could say, well, May, what if they use the same technology? You know, it's like a, it's a heat flow thing. You know, you're doing some heat flow thing. I'm doing a heat dissipation thing. Maybe I could learn something from you, right? So the components don't interface, but maybe they have a good sort of technical reason to interface, to interact with each other and learn from each other. It could be a manufacturing technology in aerospace, like, you know, how do we make, you know, composite fan blades? Maybe that's similar to the way we make compressor vanes or whatever. So you could imagine reasons for that. Or maybe they should be talking to each other. Maybe there should be an interface, and they just haven't ever written down the interface. Okay, so a, the idea is if you could develop the hypotheses, and then you could find out that additional information, then we could test the hypothesis. I'm going to show you how we test one hypothesis. Okay, so I'm going to look at the matrix of the red cells. So the red ones, remember, those are the, the component interfaces. So this is the system architecture, and I've added in where there's a blue cell that overlaps. So this is red and purple. There's no, all the unmatched blue cells are not shown here. So again, of all the 569 component interfaces, 
60% of them turned purple, 40% of them didn't. And the hypothesis I'm going to test is the one actually about organization of system boundaries. So what that would say is component A interfaces with component B, but those components are in different subsystems. And for each, and, and for each subsystem, there's also a subsystem team. So there are different organization subunits, and they're in different subsystems. And since those happen to be the same, I don't know, is this an organizational distance, or is it kind of a product architecture distance? They're the same. And so, so the way I would test that is say, well, is this 60-40 ratio, 60% purple, 40% red, is that sort of uniform across the whole matrix, or is there something special about the black squares? In particular, is it higher or lower inside the black squares, higher or lower outside? And the answer is, inside the black squares, 79%, which is probably what you would guess. If they're inside the black squares, that means they're in the same subsystem they're very likely to talk to each other because it's nearby organizational distance. And then outside the black squares, 48%, which is to say half of the time they don't talk to each other. So, so the vast majority of the mismatch, the opportunity to improve, the way I think of it, is outside the organizational boundaries. But just take that analysis one additional step further. Is there anything special about the difference between the modular and the more distributed subsystems? And so we look at this 48% number, which is, remember, that's the fraction of interfaces they address by talking to each other outside the organizational boundaries of the, of, the, of the system teams. And the question is, are these guys in the modular subsystem teams, the fan and compressor and so forth, better or worse at it than these ones who had this more, I this more sort of integrated purview? And the answer is they only address about one-third of them outside, 36%. Huge opportunity for doing that better. Look at all those, those, red, those red marks. And, then, but, and these guys only do about half of them, too. So I'm not sure this is the place to learn it from. OK. The upshot of this is, on the one hand, this analysis is not for the faint of heart. I mean, I, I, I don't go into companies and say, you should do exactly this. I mean, it, it takes a bit of sort of getting used to doing this analysis. On the other hand, the insight that comes out of it that you're less likely to, to work on the kind of integration that's really going to lead to high performance if there's a, a system architecture structure that doesn't enable it. That's a super powerful insight. And we're able to operationalize that not just at the kind of one sentence level, but at the level of even specific um, interfaces. Okay, um, that's a little taste of the kind of work I've been doing for the last 15 years. Uh, just for those of you who are interested in following up on it, there's a nice book about this. It came out a couple of years ago. I wrote it with one of my um, former doctoral students. Um, and the architecture of this book is pretty similar to the architecture of this seminar. So if, if you would like to look at the book, um, by that I mean there's two chapters on each of those types of DSM analysis. So there's two chapters on product and system architecture models two chapters on organization models, two chapters on process models, a couple of chapters on these multi-domain models that we talked about toward the end and, and some other more advanced ways to use the methods. And of the two chapters, one chapter explains the methods. How do we do the analysis? How do you collect the data? What does it mean? All that. And then one chapter with a whole bunch of industry examples. Um, so I think there's a total of 44 examples across the different chapters. The examples are some from my research, some from other industries, from, from, uh, some from other researchers around the world, uh, one even from Denmark. And finally, um, each one, you know, we have actually all the data from the DSM that's been quite useful for a number of researchers. And MIT Press, which published this book, actually, um, they print the whole book in color with really nice quality graphics, because they actually believed, when I explained it to them, that it's not just we need a nice coffee table book, but rather, this is something that, you know, the graphics really help the method work, and they help the people interpret it, and they're integral to the method, and color is a key part of that. Okay, um, finally, I think this is my last slide. Um, I actually was asked to comment on the impact of this work. Um, okay, one way to measure the impact is, okay, we've written dozens and dozens of papers, I've worked with a lot of different companies, I mean, that's nice. Um, but actually, outside of my own work, there have been hundreds of other people who have followed along, that has uh, gone off and done this type of work in other industries and in other parts of the world, some of it here in, in Denmark and other parts of Europe and around the world. Um, and so what has led to that? 
that the adoption in industry is now hundreds and hundreds of companies have been using these methods um, to improve the way they engineer their systems. Um, so I think um, on the one hand, as an academic, you know, it's really useful to start with a very important problem, a compelling problem. And generally, we don't have a difficult time explaining why our work is important. Um, and then pairing that with an innovative approach, you know, an approach that people find a little bit different, a little bit curious. In my case, I think the graphical power of this method helped to make it look, um, and I think, be somewhat innovative. Um, second, there's just something about interdisciplinary problems that many of you I know also work in. Um, and in my case, my background is in engineering, and the engineers look at this as social science. Now, the social scientists look at it and say, that's not social science. That must be what engineers do. Now, so there's something about, in my particular role at MIT, I'm in the Sloan School of Management with a doctorate in engineering, my role is to do work that's on the interface. And I actually think that interdisciplinary work is, is in many, many fields, the cutting edge of the field. And actually, here at DTU, you look at the departments you have, instead of having six engineering departments, you have 22. And the definition of those has a whole lot of interdisciplinary perspectives across them. So I actually think you're really onto something uh, that's really important and special. Um, the third thing is the vast majority of the funding I've used for this work has come from industry. And not to say that government funding is bad, I just found it to be it doesn't help me get access to the industry. And there's a huge amount of effort to work with government funding. So. As much as I appreciate that I was the director of a big engineering research center funded by the National Science Foundation, which contributes to this work, it, didn't, it wasn't complete. Without the funding from industry, I never could have gotten this done. So now I have all my research funding from industry grants. And along with the funding comes with the connection with the company. So they're very interested in giving you access because now, you know, instead of going to any old company to demonstrate the methods, they have demonstration in their own context. It's my job to generalize from that, of course. Um, and finally, those industry examples can then go into my work and into the writing. So one of the features that's characterized my work, and I think one of the reasons it's been held in somewhat high regard in, in the field is every paper has an industry example. And actually, if you look at my 100 papers, there's 100 different examples. And, and some people look and say, well, how on earth do you, you know, get the data from so many different companies? And, and have that kind of access. Well, uh, finally, I've worked with some wonderful students and some amazing colleagues and collaborators, some of whom are here at, at, at DTU and have been connecting with DTU, as was mentioned in, in, in the introduction. Um, so this has been a, um, a wonderful uh, type of work to be able to share with you. And I hope some of you learned a little bit about how we engineer complex systems as a result. Uh, with that, I mean, here's a kind of a graphical picture in summary, or if you prefer the examples, <laughs> there's another graphical one. So I'd be happy to hear your reactions or take some questions if we have a few minutes for that before the reception. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for a very clear and I think also exciting, inspiring presentation. We have time, as Steve said, for a few questions. Uh, so if anyone would like to uh, ask one, please, you're welcome. Yes, please uh, st uh, state your name, speak into the ball, and state your name and, and then your question. My name is Lei Yang from Biosustain DTU. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question is, uh, how do you envision the future with AI replacing people? Like, where do you put them in the process or organization? Is it going to make the architect a bit more difficult or easier? Thank yeah, you. that's a good question. Um, so two reactions to that. Um, first of all, with AI and maybe data mining and deep learning set of methods, we might be able to more automatically extract these data on complex systems using whatever the data sets might be. It might be the 3D CAS systems for electromechanical things. It might be extracting the data out of software systems you know, by, by kind of deeply looking at, at, at the code. In terms of what, what we call superminds, which is that there are people in the system and then there are also algorithms, AI-based or other kinds of algorithms in the system. Um, well, what we know is that to make those systems work well, they're going to work together. And, and they're going to 
hopefully utilize the best of what people can do in terms of using intuition and judgment and experience, as well as the best of what the algorithms can do, which is using the real data in an unbiased way. My guess in terms of what the structures will look like is, of course, the algorithms have a wonderful ability to take in lots and lots of data. So you would see those as more connected. And whether I put them at the bottom or the top or the middle of the matrix, they're going to have a lot of interfaces because they're going to take a lot, a lot of data. And I would, I'd love to see a system that, that is um, structured like that. Um, we're doing some work at MIT on what we call superminds, these integrated systems, and uh, we might try to do some of that. Thank you. Yes, we have a possibility of another question. Over here. Ah. Mm. Yeah, we start I think up there. The red and ball's then you going over that way first, so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Christian Kahneman. I'm from the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, uh, so nice, nice to be to back see you, here. Christian. I used to be here. Um, uh, I was interested about your, the, the process architecture uh, part of your matrix analysis and this notion of undiscovered rework and all those pink Unplanned. dots. Unplanned. Unplanned, sorry. Uh, if you. Um, if you um, could that be used actually as a way to design, say, concurrent engineering processes? Because it seemed that a lot of them had to do with proper specs that would inform earlier stages in the product design. And if you can somehow modularize the product for future generations, that would allow you then to work on a subsystem that you can reuse later on for the next generation of the product. I mean, are those kinds of thoughts of, of sort of staggering the product process Mm -hmm. uh, are they something that you've been working with? Yeah, Thank exactly. You. That is actually a very good thought. Um, and and, and it, it's true that the, the difficulty of, doing the, the, of running these processes is largely around the unplanned iterations or the unplanned work, the kind of rework that sort of ties up the process and makes it less predictable and slower and frustrating. Um, and what we've observed is that as processes improve, as they get more experienced and more mature, we end up with fewer of those unplanned iterations. Why? Because we've tried to eliminate them. They're frustrating and difficult. And there are a number of ways that we could replace them with other things. For example, a good specification. And the good specification might require another process step, but it'd be one that maybe takes a little extra time, agree on that upfront interface spec or whatever it is, and that slows down the process by having that additional step. But to what benefit? The benefit is it, it eliminates a really nasty problem that only happens sometimes. And for most organizations, they'd like to have the smoother process that eliminates the nasty problems that only happen occasionally with more planned and predictable work up front, which can also get improved and get faster and faster every time. So uh, your, your thinking is definitely along the, the right track. Yeah, thank you. Was it on this? Oh, there's one over there. Oh, yeah, I think the microphone around. went off. Oh, you're going to turn upside down. There you go. Christian Wagner from VLOX making roof windows and skylights. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in when you work with companies like GM or Intel, uh, what kind of effort does it take to do all the analysis in, in these fairly complex organizations and, and structures? Yeah. Uh, are we talking months or half year or whatever? So that's the right time frame. And the actual, actual effort is um, to make the models I've shown you is roughly one person month of effort. So one good analyst, like my student or you know, who's been trained, or someone at the company who is a process expert and trained, about a month's work. But that person needs to connect with a bunch of other people or data or something like that. But it's one person month's kind of assignment or project. Um, and then you know, what we do with it might go beyond that. Okay, so now that we've got the matrix and it teaches us these brilliant insights, now we might take it further and say, okay, now how do we fix that problem? How do we re-architect this? And that might go on uh, after that. Honestly, that's the part in which we at MIT get, in, get less involved. We're happy to develop the methods, create the ways to generate the insights. Okay, I think we will uh, stop here. Uh, we have a reception going on afterwards outside, and uh, Steve Eppinger will be there, so uh, you yes, may will. also have the chance to ask a question to him there. Please give him time to rest his voice as well. He's been busy now for an hour. So I would like to conclude this uh, by thanking you once more for a very fine presentation. And uh, let's give it a final hand.